So, so far we've had vector fields in the plane, and then we had Green's theorem, which tells us, oh, you want to integrate this vector field around this curve, then Green's theorem relates that integral, the integral of the vector field around the curve in the plane, to a double integral over the region contained inside the curve um, of a quantity involving the partial derivatives of the components of the vector field. Then we had flux integrals in space. So you had a surface in space, and we defined what it meant for to have a flux integral. Kind of think of either magnetic fields or velocity field, vector fields of, of moving fluid uh, flowing through the surface. And we wanted to, so we wanted to calculate these flux integrals, integrals over the surface. And the divergence theorem told us, oh, well, that equals um, the, inter the triple integral of the divergence over the solid region contained inside the surface. This section is on Stokes' theorem, and it's, oh, but what if you had a curve in space? Right? We looked at curves in the plane, surfaces in space, but what if you had a curve in space? Well, again, you could ask for the line integral of a vector field along the curve. And you might go, oh, well, there must be something like Green's theorem, where, oh, the line integral the line integral of the vector field around the curve should be able, you should be able to write it in terms of, of a double integral over the surface whose boundary is the curve. The problem is there are an infinite number of surfaces that all bound the same curve. Which one do you pick, or how do you define some integral that's independent of which surface you pick? And that is the content of Stokes' theorem. Um, it's fairly difficult. We'll do kind of one, one extended example, so one example, and then I'll mess with it a little bit, and, and that'll be it. Um, Stokes' theorem is important, um, especially in electromagnetism and Maxwell's equations, but those applications are beyond the scope of what I want to do here. So, um, all right, first, we need to talk about orientation of, of surfaces and curves in space. So you should remember that when we looked at Green's theorem, in the plane, we wanted to pick the positive orientation of the curve, so we had a closed curve. We picked the positive orientation to be counterclockwise. Well, if now we're in space, and if you picture the xy plane as where z is zero in space, then counterclockwise, the counterclockwise orientation, it's also you could describe it in three dimensions as if, you, if your head is pointed in the positive z direction and you're walking in the direction of the arrows, then the region is always on your left. Um, right? If your head is pointed in the positive z direction, like I'm standing now, and you walk in the direction of the arrows, counterclockwise in the xy plane means the region would always be on your left. That's what we want in general, so we're going to have we're going to have some surface in space, and there's going to be some curve that's its boundary. So we're going to have some surface. And some curve that's its boundary. Maybe I'll draw the curve in orange. We want an orientable surface. In fact, we want to pick an orientation on the surface, which means we decide is the positive direction, like on this surface, is it that way or is it that way? You pick a normal vector, so something perpendicular to the tangent plane, and you want a unit normal, and do you pick them all to point that way or that way? Well, you can pick them either way for a surface, but the point is we now want to say when the surface and the curve have compatible orientations. Um, so what do you do? you kind of, you generalize what I said right here. It's, all right, you pick an orientation on the surface. You pick an orientation on the surface, so that means you make a choice of that, that way or this way. Um, you know, it's an assumption that we're using orientable surfaces so that you can do that. And then, what do we want the positive direction on this boundary curve to be? So, um, we want it to be the one so that if you walked around the curve in the direction indicated by the orientation with your head pointing, so 
up, the positive direction is that way. So over here, the positive direction is kind of out of the board again. You want to keep the surface on your left. So here I've drawn compatible orientations. If you follow this curve around and keep your head pointed in the direction of the outward pointing unit normal, so at these points it would be coming out of the board, then the region is on your left. This is a compatible orientation between between the surface and the boundary curve. Um, I should say, of course, we need all these technical conditions on the surface, like we had in other sections. We need, we need that it's compact, connected, piecewise regular, but now with boundary. I typically call the surface M. Um, I'm really thinking manifold when I write that. And the curve is the boundary of M. And when I write M in the boundary of M in, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to mean they're given a compatible orientation, so this one. But um, if you took the other orientation on M, so the inward pointing normals, you would have to orient the boundary of M in the opposite direction too. All right, so there's a compatible orientation. Before I state Stokes' theorem, I need to remind you of one thing that we haven't seen in quite a while. When I first introduced vector fields, so we want a vector field on, well, at least an open neighborhood of the surface that we're talking about in R3. The vector field will have three components, three component functions, which I'll call P, Q, and R. And what you may or may not remember is the curl of the vector field. This is the kind of cumbersome operation. The curl, also written as the gradient operator crossed with f. And this is how you want to think of it because it tells you how to calculate it. You put i, j, and k up as the first row of a matrix. You put the, 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 the gradient operator, so the partial derivative operators, in the second row. And you put the components of f in the third row, and you take this determinant. So you can write it out, but this is how you want to calculate it. It's just kind of painful to memorize. Right? So what do you get? Well, times i, you get the partial of r with respect to y, minus this times this, and minus the partial of q with respect to z. That's in the i component. In the j component, you get negative. You delete the row and column containing j, and so you get, then you take the determinant of the remaining, this times this, so the partial of r with respect to x, minus this times this, so minus the partial of p with respect to z, and the sign alternates back to a plus. You delete the row and column containing k, and you get this times this, so you get the partial of q with respect to x, minus the partial of p with respect to y. All right, so that's the curl. What does Stokes' theorem say? Stokes' theorem is a generalization of Green's theorem. It'll look a lot more complicated than Green's theorem, but then I'll, I'll show you why it's a generalization. Um, and then we'll do one extended example. So Stokes' theorem. You know, the, the technical assumptions we need to a piecewise, so we need a compact, connected, piecewise, regular surface with an orientation and a compatible, with boundary, a compatible orientation on the surface and on the boundary curve. Um, we need a continuously differentiable vector field on an open neighborhood containing the surface, but then the statement is easy. Or <laughs> it's easy to write. The line integral along the boundary curve with its orientation of f dot dr, it's a flux integral. It's the flux integral over m of what? It's the flux of the curl of f. 
So it is uh, typically a oh, flux of the curl. Um, so here is the curl of F, the flux integral of a vector field. So you take this vector field, the curl of F, it's a new vector field, and you dot that within and you integrate over the surface. As you can see, this is a complicated device. I mean, flux integrals are already complicated, right? You have to parameterize surfaces. And um, you know, if this were just a vector field, parameterize a surface, either calculate normals or, or you know, see geometrically what unit normals are, and then calculate this. But now it's the flux of the curl. All right, so this can be pretty bad. Um, we're going to do an example where it's not. But before I do that, what I'd like to see is why does this collapse? Why does this become Green's theorem? For regions and vector fields in the plane. So if everything's in the plane, So the question is, this thing is supposed to be a generalization of Green's theorem, which means if you start with the assumptions of Green's theorem, somehow this reduces to what Green's theorem says, which may not be obvious. Um, so let's see why it's true. So in Green's theorem, in Green's theorem, M, the, the surface that we're talking about, is a region in the xy plane. This is, is in the xy plane, so it's the curve, of course, because it's the boundary. And F of xy is some vector field. Pxy, qxy. All right, so suppose you start with this, and you know Stokes' theorem. How would you conclude Green's theorem? Well, you need a vector field on, all, on R3, first of all. So you define a new vector field, which I'll call F hat. I'll put a little hat on it, which is a vector field that looks like it depends on three variables, but I'll actually define it to be um, just P of xy in the first component q of xy, the ones you're given for the setup to Green's theorem, q of xy in the second component, and zero in the third component. And we're going to apply Stokes' theorem to the, to the region m in the xy plane and this vector field and see that it reduces to Green's theorem. Um, I should point out that because this vector field in three dimensions has the same p and q as the vector field in two dimensions, that here, here, these are that p and that q, the partial of q with respect to x, the partial of p with respect to y. And in fact, we don't care what we get here. So if we now take, so what I'm saying is, if we take the curl of this, if we take the curl of this f hat, we get something something that we don't care about. We'll see why we don't care in a second. This, and this is the two-dimensional curl that appears in Green's theorem. Right. So what does Stokes' theorem tell us? Oh, Stokes' theorem tells us, oh, the line integral along, if m is in the xy plane, the line integral of f hat dot dr, which, because f hat is written like this, that line integral and the normal, actually maybe I'll write this out. 
dr is dx, dy, dz, and you dot it with this, but you have a zero there, you're just going to get p dx plus q dy, right? dr, this is dx, dy, dz in three dimensions. But you've got a zero there, so when you dot with the zero, you just get this. But this is one side of what you see in Green's theorem in the plane, the integral around the boundary of m of p dx plus q dy, because this is the same as the, in the line integral of f, not f hat, dot dr, where this dr means in the plane. Um, <clears throat> I also want to point out that, yeah, our notion of orientation means that we've got the orientation that you have in Green's theorem. We've got some m in the xy plane and a positively oriented boundary. And yeah, that still means that you're going counterclockwise because our positive orientation means if your head sticks in the positive z direction and you walk in the direction of the curve, then the region is on your left. Well, that's counterclockwise. So the orientation that we're using is the same as from Green's theorem. And then what, what does Stokes' theorem tell us this equals? It tells us that it equals the double integral of the curl of f dotted within, but we're, we're looking at a region that's in the xy plane. And we've oriented the curve counterclockwise, which means we've picked the upward pointing normal, but that unit normal is always k. <laughs> so what Stokes' theorem tells you is this is the curl of f hat dotted with n ds, but now all of this collapses to what you see in Green's theorem. The curl of f hat dotted with n, n is 0, 0, 1. That's why I didn't care what was here and here. If you dot this with k, which is our unit normal, all it does, multiplies that by 0, multiplies that by 0, multiplies that by 1, and adds, you just end up with the two-dimensional curl. So you end up with the partial derivative of q with respect to x minus the partial derivative of p with respect to y. Great. So that's what we get for this. And ds, it's a flat region. ds is just dA. So we get dA and we get the two-dimensional curl. And that's how you recover Green's theorem. So Stokes' theorem Stokes' theorem reduces to Green's theorem if your vector field is in the xy plane and your region is in the xy plane. All right. That's why Stokes' theorem is a generalization of Green's theorem, but now can we actually give an example where we can actually calculate things that's not a region in the xy plane? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll look at one. It's... Um, you know, you have to pick these a little carefully to make them manageable. So, let's look at the example. I have a very specific one in mind. All right. I want to take the plane so let's assume this is the plane where y equals z regardless of what it looks like the plane where y equals z and then I'm going to take a circle so through the origin and then I'm going to take a circle that of radius 3 centered at the origin in that plane. So I need to try to draw that in perspective, slanted quite a bit. All right, so that is supposed to be, <laughs> again, whether it looks like it or not, a circle of radius 3 centered at the origin in the plane y equals z. Um, okay, and I have a I want my M, my M is going to be this region, so the disk 
inside that circle of radius 3. Its boundary is the circle. I have a choice of which way to orient. I could make the positive direction on m that way. Or I could make the positive direction on m that way. I'm going to pick the up, kind of the one that has a positive z component. So here's my n, which means that my boundary circle, the boundary of m, should be oriented that way so that if I walk around that way, keeping my head pointed in that direction, the region's always to my left. Um, so there's the boundary of M with its orientation. Um, that unit normal, we can actually write down which one that is. Right? This plane, we have to go back a little bit in our knowledge. This plane is this plane. A normal, once you've got a plane written in standard form, A normal, you just read off um, the, comp the coefficients of the variables, so a normal to the plane, and so to that disk, is 0, the coefficient in front of x, 0, 1, minus 1. That doesn't have is. Um, that doesn't have length 1. You need to divide by its magnitude. So you need a unit normal. It has length two, uh, square root of 2. So here's a unit normal. So the unit normal is this. So we get a normal by just reading off the coefficients of the variables in the standard equation for the plane, or a standard equation for the plane. And we make it a unit normal. Is that the one I've got drawn here? No, this one has a positive z component. We need the negative of this one. So our n, the n that I'm going to use is the negative of this one. 0 minus 1, 1 over the square root of 2. All right. What? do I want to use for my vector field? For my vector field, I want the fairly unattractive For my vector field, I'm going to use f is e to the x plus y x plus x plus sine y plus 2z, 3x minus 5y plus z squared. And we are interested in calculating the line integral of f, the line integral of f along the boundary of m with the given orientation. Now, there's a question of which way the flow of information in Stokes' theorem goes. Like, do you want to know the line integral and it's too hard to calculate it from the definition? And so you use Stokes' theorem and calculate the flux integral instead? Or do you want the flux integral of the curl and instead you calculate the line integral? Um, typically in examples, you want this and you use Stokes' theorem to reduce it to the a flux integral of the curl, um, even though you could parameterize the circle, um, stick it in, stick the parameterization into f, dot with r prime of t, and integrate with respect to t, and do that. But I'm not going to. I'm going to use Stokes' theorem. I'm going to calculate the double integral over the surface, so the flux integral of the curl of f, Dot uh, n ds. All right. N. We know n. <laughs> it's the vector we found over there. So it's 0 minus 1, 1 divided by the square root of 2. So maybe I'll write that over here too. N equals 0 minus 1, 1 divided by the square root of 2. We need the curl of f. Um, we're going to dot with n, so we don't care what's in its first component, because it'll get dotted with 0. But we need at least the second two components of the curl of f. So there's no way around it. You just have to calculate the curl of f i j k. That's not going to fit there. i j k um, partial derivative operators. and then the components of the vector field. 
e to the x plus y, x plus sine of y plus 2z, x plus the sine of y plus 2z, 3x minus 5y plus z squared. All right, we want to calculate this, this determinant. Um, I'll try to fit it right here. First of all, we don't care about the i component, so I'm just going to leave it as there's, we're going to get just something times i. We don't care what it is. Plus, all right, in the j component, you get negative, you get negative, and then it's, so you delete the row and column containing j, think this times this, but it means apply the operator, so the partial derivative of this with respect to x, so we get 3, um, minus this times this, which is 0, and this doesn't depend on z at all, so um, minus 0, that's what we get times j, and then the sign alternates back to a plus, and you delete the row and column containing k, and you get this times this, so this done to this, so you just get a 1, minus this done to this, so you get minus a 1. So we're just getting that our vector field looks like there's something possibly in the i position that we don't care about. We get minus 3 in the second position, so in the j position, and a, a 0 in the, in the k position. All right, so we get that, and now we're going to dot. We're going to dot within. So what do you get? Um, I guess I'm going to put it. <laughs> Let me go up the board. So I'm going to go up. So we're here for the cross product. So we just got double integral over m of, we get something, minus 3, 0, dotted with 0, minus 1, 1, over the square root of 2, times ds. So we get 0 plus 3 over the square root of 2 plus 0. And so you get 3 over the square root of 2 for the integrand. I'm going to pull that out. You get 3 over the square root of 2 times the double integral over m of ds. And now here's where I made this problem really easy. What's the double integral over m of ds? Well, ds is a little infinitesimal chunk of surface area. And you integrate it over all of m. Well, that's just the area of m. But we know it's a disk of radius 3. So now we can cheat. <laughs> we don't have to integrate anything. It's a disk of radius 3. So we know its area. We get 3 over the square root of 2 times pi times 3 squared. So we get 27 pi over the square root of 2. So that's the flux integral. Um, yes, this was a very carefully chosen example so that we didn't actually have to um, parameterize anything. We didn't have to, um, we certainly didn't have to do in a real integral to calculate the area. We knew because it was the area inside a circle. All right, but that's an example of how you use Stokes' theorem. Um, we wanted the line integral. We reduced it to a flux integral, and it turned out the flux integral was easy, um, both because the curl dotted within came out to be a constant and because we, had a, we know a formula for the surface area. All right, um, I said I was only going to do one example and then mess with it, so now I'm about to mess with it. Um, all right, what if we didn't want the, the flux integral over that m? So we just found the flux integral over m is 27 pi over the square root of 2. What if you're now given the problem of how, calculate the flux integral over, over, <laughs> I'm not sure it's clear from my picture, I should probably redraw it, but 
I want a flux integral. I want to take a hemisphere, but slanted. I want to take this hemisphere. Hemisphere, I'll call it H. H of radius 3. on this side of the plane, but that has the same boundary circle that we were just looking at. Um, so here's, M is still that, let's call M that disk, the boundary of M is still that, and here's H. And the boundary of H is the same as the boundary of M, right? And including the orientation, if I orient H outward, so I'm going to orient H outward, um, and then this is positively oriented for M and it's positively oriented for H. So I'll just write equals boundary of M and I mean as oriented curves. But my question now is, okay, that's a much more complicated surface. And suppose you're now asked for, haha, how do you calculate the flux integral over H of the same of the curl of the same vector field F dotted with N DS where DS is now little chunks of area on H and N is the outward pointing unit normal on H or that the positive unit and the curl of F is still what we what we had before but the this dot product is no longer what it was before because the unit normals have changed DS now curves right little DS before was was flat and we had a formula for it there. Well, we know a formula for the area of a hemisphere, but it's not clear that that'll help us any because we don't, well, I mean, this, it's true actually that this still comes out to be a constant, but this isn't a constant vector. So you, you're not just going to get some constant that pulls out anymore, right? The, the unit normal is definitely changing as you move points. So this flux integral looks much more complicated than the one that we calculated a minute ago. How do you calculate it? Well, it's, it's a cool kind of thing of, uh, about a cool feature of Stokes theorem. They both have the same boundary curve with the same orientation. And Stokes theorem applies to this just like it applied to the other one. And it says, oh, well this is the integral along the boundary of H of f dot dr, and it, we're using the same f that we were before. But, but the boundary of h is the boundary of m. So this is the same as the boundary of m. But that's what we calculated a minute ago. Right? We used Stokes' theorem to calculate this. We got that it was 27 pi over the square root of 2. And it's true we did it, we did it by calculating the flux integral over m. So this is sometimes how Stokes' theorem gets used. And understand that this is a different n. This n in ds refers to on m, while this n in ds refers to on h. This is, it's, you want this flux integral. Well, it equals this line integral. You want this flux integral. It equals this line integral. So it's kind of an amazing thing that the curl makes these flux integrals come out to be the same. It means that you take any surface. So first we had a disk. That was M. Then we had this hemisphere. That's H. You take any surface, you know, piece, compact, connected, piecewise regular surface, whose boundary is M you know, with the right orientation, and the flux integral of F over that surface will always be the same. It doesn't matter how weird the surface is because they're all equal to the line integral around the boundary which is a cool use of Stokes' theorem. It's, yeah, you want this. Well, this is easy to calculate. They both equal the line integral. So you're done. So that's one of the cool, you know, I said I was only going to do one example, but then I was going to mess with it. That's one of the ways you can mess with that example to use it as an example of, oh, you want to calculate one flux integral over a surface. Instead, you take an easier surface. So if you start with the problem of H, calculating the flux integral of F over H, you go, oh, I'd rather calculate the flux integral over this surface that has the same boundary. Um, 
you know, we did them as separate problems, but. All right, I haven't finished messing with this. There's only one other thing I want to say, though. It, you may wonder, how could those possibly come out to be the same? And in a way, well, you, you kind of should know, or I don't know, maybe not know, but if you thought about it long enough, Suppose we take these two surfaces. If, you want, if it bothers you that the two integrals are coming out to be the same, I'd like to explain it. And suppose you take both surfaces together, so M and H, well then they enclose a solid region. Right? M and H together, right? It's the hemisphere with, maybe I should draw it again. It's a, you've got a hemisphere and you fill in the bottom. Right, so you've got, um, actually, why don't I draw it like this? So you've got a hemisphere and you fill in the bottom. So it fills in a closed solid region. Right? There's a solid region E bounded by, you take H up here, and you take our M, our disk, down here, and they bound a solid region. And then we can use the divergence theorem on the solid region. Um, um, I should say, though, that the divergence theorem uses a different orientation. So that, I, I'm trying to explain why these two flux integrals would come out to be the same. So we're going to apply the divergence theorem. I now have to assume our vector field is continuously second differentiable, but I'm going to apply the divergence theorem. To what vector field, not F, the curl of F, and the solid region E. What the divergence theorem told us was that if you take the double integral, so this is now a closed surface, right? The, the boundary of E is a closed surface. It's H together with M, so I'll write union. It told us that the double integral over the boundary of E of the flux of our vector field, so F, so of the curl of F dot, so this is the flux of our vector field, equals the divergence over the solid, integrated over the solid region. So the divergence, we write the gradient operator dotted with the vector field. This is what the divergence theorem told us, tells us. If you apply it to the curl of F in the region E, now you have to be a little careful. <laughs> or actually, you have to be pretty, uh, very careful. This, it's an easy exercise. It's done in the book. You can do it yourself. The divergence of the, of the curl of a vector field, this is always zero. This equals zero. So that this double integral over the boundary of E is zero, right? Because this integrand is zero on the nose, but the boundary of E is H union M. And it, so it looks like this is saying, oh, so the flux integral over H plus the flux integral over M equals zero. You have to be careful with the orientations. In the divergence theorem, and I was I was deliberately, I deliberately left it out. In the divergence theorem, we need outward pointing unit normals. So the, the, what we considered the positive direction on H, those vectors are outward pointing, ones that point out of the solid region. But on M, the, the normal, the, our orientation on M was the same one here. It's outward pointing, it was, sorry, upward pointing, so that way. But that's not the one you need for the divergence theorem. For the divergence theorem, you have to be pointed this way. And so really we should say the boundary of E, if we're taking care of orientations, 
is H union negative M to indicate that we have to reverse the orientation on M and take unit normals that point in the other direction. And then once you do that, what this tells you, the boundary of, of E is H together with M, but with its negative orientation. And that means that the double integral over H of the flux of the curl. And then you add the double integral over negative M, but that means subtract the double integral over M of the flux integral of the curl of F. And it says that difference is zero. Well, that means these two integrals are the same. And that's what we concluded, right, from, from one of our conclusions from Stokes' theorem is that, oh, the integral over any surface that has this boundary would be the same. Yeah, in fact, you can see it from the divergence theorem because if you then unite those two surfaces, they enclose a solid region. And then the divergence theorem tells you that the divergence of the curl is, since the divergence of the curl is zero, that those two flux integrals have to give you the same thing, um, but you have to pay attention to how the orientation changes in the two problems. And in Stokes' theorem, we wanted the orientations kind of point in compatible directions. In, in the divergence theorem, they always have to point out of the solid region, which means you have to reverse the orientation on one of your surfaces. All right. Um, that's all I want to do on Stokes' theorem. It's, um, a, complicated, it's a complicated theorem. It, it generates a lot of complicated examples. It's theoretically important. Um, it's computationally intensive, unless you pick some very special examples. But um, the exercises are uh, chosen carefully.